Come here. Get off. Friends, homies, lovers, <laughs> niggas and bitches. Welcome <laughs> to this week's episode of The Turn On. Um, this is your host, Erica and Killa, two hoes mm-hmm. making it clap. That's us. I'm, I really like that all of those turns were completely non-gendered. <laughs> <laughs> because of course. <laughs> niggas and bitches. Niggas and bitches. <laughs> um, so this week we are reading Bittersweet, which was written in 2019 by our good friend Christina C. Jones. So sit back, relax, get your wine, get your weed, get your whatever you need, and enjoy. Bittersweet by Christina C. Jones. I was getting my whole entire life to the Temptations version of Silent Night when a knock at the door interrupted my damn falsetto. I'd only heard it because of a break in the music and was tempted to simply ignore it until I realized what time it was. Late. I frowned as I grabbed the remote to turn the music down, then checked my phone to make sure I hadn't missed a call with some kind of emergency. I had not. Hmm. Annoyed, I walked up to the door, peering out of the peephole to see who it was. (sighs) Royal. What the hell do you want? I shouted through the door, not exactly keen on answering for him since there was no telling what else I might end up opening without a wall between us. I'll say it to your face, he called back. Ugh, I unlocked and opened a door but didn't unlatch the chain. Fine, here's my face. What do you want? He held up my abandoned gloves, hat, and scarf. All articles I'd sorely missed when I fled his presence at the coffee house. I was going to just leave it all outside your door, but you got the whole building jumping right now. So I figured you were up. Didn't you close tonight? I asked. It's almost one in the morning and you just had to bring me this stuff. Rail shrugged, his movement somewhat camouflaged by his own cold weather protection. Don't you open the shop tomorrow? Can't have you walking to work cold. I stared at him for a moment, then unhooked the chair, opening the door wide enough to actually take my things from him. Thank you. You're welcome. He peeked past me into the apartment. You got to looking pretty festive in there and sounding like a party. You're expecting company? No. He leaned against my doorframe, one thick eyebrow lifting on his entirely too handsome face. Would you like some? I opened my mouth to give him the no he likely expected before he even asked, but it wouldn't come out. Whether it was my heightened emotions or the alcohol or goddamn Ariana Grande singing with it this Christmas in the background, what actually came from my lips was, sure, come in. It shocked both of us. His eyes went wide in hell, so did mine, but I stepped aside to give him room and he stepped in, taking off his coat. Do you want anything to drink? I asked once he stashed his coat, hat, and gloves and was just standing in my apartment looking at me like I was what he wanted to quench his thirst. Sure, he shrugged. I'll have whatever you're drinking. I nodded. Well, it was eggnog, but I finished the last of that. I'm on the spike hot chocolate now. The one from Guilty Pleasures that we use at Urban Grind? Duh. I grabbed a mug from the cabinet then went to the stove. I made a whole pop. He didn't say anything against it, so I filled his mug halfway, then poured a generous shot of bourbon into a separate glass. I handed him both to let him regulate his own liquor intake. He poured half of it into his hot chocolate and the rest down his throat, without flinching. It was a little rough tonight, he explained, handing me the shot glass back. We got slammed right before closing. Great for profits, but not so good for the staff. I chuckled. Yeah, I've had more of those nights than I can count, but looks like you survived it, though. He took a long sip from his mug and nodded. Yeah, I made it out pretty okay. And I got invited inside for a drink, 
oh, I'm good now. Don't read too much into it, I told him, shaking my head. It doesn't mean anything. Like that kiss didn't, right? Yes, exactly. I moved out of the kitchen to retrieve my own mug, which I left on the coffee table to answer the door. I wasn't surprised that Royal followed me, nor was I surprised by his overfamiliarity and making himself comfortable in my space. Make yourself at home, I said, bringing a grin to Royal's face before he took a long sip from his mug. Don't gotta tell me twice. He reached up, hooking an arm around my waist to pull me down into his lap. Only my most valiant effort kept me from spilling my drink all over both of us. Dude, what the fuck? I screeched, turning to him with furrowed brows. He shrugged, his face way too close to mine. You told me to make myself at home, meaning get comfortable. I can't speak for you, but this is as comfortable as hell to me. Yeah, but, but nothing, he interrupted, shaking his head. He'd already put his own mug down and now he took mine, stowing it beside his. Don't tell me this doesn't feel good, doesn't feel right. I let out a sigh, but I couldn't really front. It did feel good. One of his arms draped around my waist, the other hanging comfortably over my thighs. It was cozy. My lack of an answer must have been answer enough because Royal moved in, kissing my neck. Immediately, my eyes fluttered closed and I silenced all the blaring alarms in my head as his hand slipped between my thighs. Just straight for the goods, huh? I breathed, barely, as the sensation of his fingers sliding over my pussy through the fabric of my leggings. We've danced around it long enough, he grunted into my ear, using his free hand to bury in my hair and turning my face toward his. Let's get to the point now. Anything I might have had to say got swallowed with a kiss. He invaded my mouth first, his hot tongue licking and exploring until he found the right place. I turned myself so that I was straddling his lap, giving both of us better access to what we wanted. Then he slipped his hand under the layers of my leggings and panties, dipping into the space between my legs. His grip on my hair kept me in place, kept me grounded as he pushed his fingers into my pussy, using his thumb against my clit to offer throb-inducing pleasure. You are really wet, he murmured against my lips, casual as hell as if I wasn't on the verge of tears from how good it felt to be touched like this by someone else. How do you want me to make you come? What? I shivered as he ran his tongue down my throat, then licked his way back up. Fingers? Mouth? Dick? He offered explaining his question as succinctly as possible as my hips began to involuntarily rock against his hand. I closed my eyes, letting my head fall back as I basked in the feeling, hypnotized by the pleasurable friction of his fingers. The hand that was in my hair he pushed underneath my sweater, quickly discovering my brawless state. My back arched against him as he plucked my nipple, pinching it hard between his fingers, no relief from the pressure as he brought his mouth back to my ear to ask his question again. Fingers, mouth, or dick? He growled and I whimpered in pain and pleasure as he squeezed me harder. All of the above, I moaned and the low rumble of his laughter in my ear almost made me come unglued. Good choice. He pressed his thumb against my clit, flicking it back and forth as his fingers plunged deep. Harder. His kissing and nibbling on my neck got reckless, and I didn't care about whatever marks might be left behind. Only the feelings. Only the orgasm. After that first one, Royal wasted no time stripping me out of my clothes with my Christmas mix still playing in the background. Right there on my couch, the same one he spent the night on, he spread my legs open wide, greedily eyeing my pussy like he couldn't wait to dive in. He used his thumbs to spread me apart, getting his face close enough to take a deep inhale before he looked up, meeting my gaze. I damn near launched off the couch when he put his hand over my already sensitive clit and sucked hard. My hands gripped the cushions as he devoured my pussy, hands gripping my ass cheeks to keep me in place. He didn't hold back, slurping and licking and fucking me with his fingers again as he commanded another orgasm out of me. And then he wasn't done. Panting and only half awake, I laid back and watched as he stripped in record speed, only stopping to retrieve a condom from his wallet. 
Just as I suspected, his dick was beautifully thick and more than enough to have me squirming underneath him as he pushed into me as far as he could go. From there, it was on. He hooked my leg over his arm and leaned in to get close as he stroked me. Deep kisses and deep strokes that had me dripping wet and moaning his name with zero reservations. Just bliss. Eventually, though, he sat up, pulling me up on the arm of the couch and hooking both of my legs over his arms. His feet were on the ground, firmly planted as he started stroking me again. Faster this time, and harder. Faster and harder, harder and faster. So fast and so hard that I couldn't even hold myself upright. I just fell back, letting my upper body rest on the couch cushion as he plunged into me. I was so glad the building was empty, because there was no chance my neighbors wouldn't have heard me crying Royal's name. Lying back on the couch like I was offered a whole new, deeper angle of entry and Royal took full advantage, slowing down to give me deep, careful, steady play strokes that had me feeling like I finally discovered life's meaning. Thighs shaking, heart racing, chest heaving. I was already fast heading over the cliff and then he started playing with my clit again as he moved, adding another layer to what was already too much. It felt too good and I drank a little too much and I was so tired from what he'd already done, but it was so good. Fuck, Anika, Royal groaned, stopping just long enough to pull me back into an upright position and releasing my legs to lock around his hips. He took my mouth with his again, even though we were both out of breath and panting. You're going to come for me again, right? You got another one in you, don't you? I shook my head. Even twice was an anomaly that had only happened when I was by myself, and that shit always put me straight to sleep. I don't know. I don't think... Nah, I need you to give me another one, he interrupted, growling the words against my lips as he buried himself impossibly deep, holding there for a moment before he pulled back. I've been good to your pussy tonight, right? Yes, I whimpered, nodding as dick-induced tears started streaming down my face. He found exactly the right spot, and somehow he knew it. He was pressing into it, sending my nerve endings reeling as I throbbed and contracted around him. Then you can give me one more. He spoke into my ear, then grazed my earlobe with his teeth. His hands gripped my ass as he finally pulled back, giving me a moment of respite from that intense spot before he stroked me again. Come for me, one more time. I want to, but I, he slammed into me hard and I completely blanked. For a moment, there was nothing in the world except me and Royal's dick pushing directly into a button that had to be labeled instant, overwhelming bliss. And the button was stuck. I couldn't even begin to explain the intensity that ran through me at that moment, sustained by the sudden arrival of his orgasm, making him pump into me as he growled into my neck. My fingernails dug into his skin, keeping my tenuous grip on reality until that otherworldly feeling passed, allowing me to collapse into the couch and slide backward, my feet still propped up on the arm as my hands fell uselessly to my sides. With a deep, satisfied breath, Royal dropped to the floor in a place where his head was close to being in line with mine. I think the goodness of it all had us both a little shaken up because neither of us said anything until finally... Royal broke the silence between us. So, can I call you Neek now? Welcome back. So that was an excerpt from Bittersweet by Christina C. Jones, which was written in 2019. So, Kenria, do you want to give us, it don't even sound right calling you Kenria. Killa. I know. Every time I call you Erica, I'll be like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> um, so, do you want to give us a synopsis of the story? Uh, okay, I will. Sure. <laughs> oh, you got it? Uh, yeah, so there's Anika. Uh, she is the manager, manager of the Urban Grind. Yes. A coffee shop slash like hangout spot. 
um, in this book, which is like, you know, the center of the workplace romance that develops. Um, as it starts, we... Skill, can I interrupt? Yeah. So one of the interesting things about our girl, Christina C. Jones, is that she she writes a lot of books. We'll mm-hmm. interview her next week and y'all will hear that. She writes a lot of books. And so Urban Grind is a part of this community community yeah this town Mm. and so urban grind is mentioned in other books these characters are mentioned in other books but this book is about the goings-on of anika our homeboy and urban grind yes sorry our homeboy's name royal royal yeah royal wasn't that uh like you're gonna be a dick wasn't that in whatchamacallit and um okay disclaimer y'all I've been drinking, so sure this episode may be just a little off. But isn't that the one, the La, La, La Royale with cheese? <laughs> Wasn't that in uh, Coming to America? No, that's in um, Pulp Fiction. Oh, shit. Never mind. Okay, continue. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, that's like the John Travolta. John Travolta. Travolta. Yeah, him. And I'm not drinking. It's the John Travolta, um, Samuel L. Jackson scene about, like, what do they call it in other countries and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Anyway, Royal. Okay. So, Royal is the cousin of the owner of the Urban Grind, and he's basically, like, pushing him to do more at the spot, and he wants to, like, make him an assistant manager or co-manager or some shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and a nigga ain't really Nepotism. On it. Yes. So she's like busting her butt and then also having to deal with his ass, like messing with her stuff in her store and calling her uptight and blah, 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 blah. So they are, this is absolutely a friends to lovers situation. I mean, uh, uh, enemies to lovers <laughs> situation because she hate that nigga in the beginning of the book. She hate him. Like for real, for real hates him. Um, it's clear that he has, he likes her. He's trolling her. He's always trying to get under her skin because he obviously likes her. Um, some things happen. They maneuver. They spend time around each other because they're forced to. And sexy hijinks ensue. Hijinks ensue. If that's on your bingo card, you got it. Check it off. Yeah. Okay. So um, remind me to write that on my bingo card. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So this is our classic enemies as lovers trope. Mm hmm. You know, and it made me think about while I was sick, I recently had another procedure and (sighs) Killa and her daughter felt like it was a job to keep me out of trouble. But bigger than that, I like dismiss Killa after a few days, but her daughter woke up every morning and was like, let me go sit down there with her. Mm -hmm. So one day we were sitting down here talking and you know she's a little girl I have a little boy and he my boy don't tell me shit he's like a safe he's like a clam he don't say shit her daughter on the other hand runs me all the gossip so I'm sitting there getting all the gossip all the gossip about the school and everybody and I ask her I say hey do you have a little boy little boy that likes you or anything no no I said do you have someone that likes you Yeah, this boy likes me, but he's always mean to me. And I instantly thought about when I was little, how they'd be like, oh, he likes you. That's why he's mean to you. And I like it. And I did. And I was like, ooh, I hate it. It's a setup for dealing with assholes. Yes. And so I was like, well, if he was a really nice person, he wouldn't be mean to you or something like that. But it was not the. In the, the typical, the typical yeah. if he likes you, you he's mean that. to you because <laughs> i hate that and i yeah. feel like women are drawn to that because we're conditioned to think that it's an if then situation if he's an asshole then he's into you no nigga he's just not into you he's a fucking he's dick a fucking asshole and either way you shouldn't be messing with him. but i feel like guys are also conditioned to be assholes as a way to get your attention Mm -hmm. and it's like if that's what you think is how it's supposed to happen then I ain't the woman for you it's just a terrible ass cycle you got to get yourself out yeah so good job saying that to her (laughs) oh yeah I mean I don't remember exactly what it was because I'm not one drank two medicated but I definitely remember being like oh no let's let's stop this right now (laughs) 
So she don't think that it's cool because a little boy is pulling your pigtails. Mm -hmm. He likes you because Mm -hmm. that is a time in which she's supposed to turn around to him and be like, you acting like a little bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Side note, yesterday, um, I had a doctor's appointment with a new oncologist and she's, we're like sitting there making small talk. And she's like, yeah, I have a 10 year old, but she's on punishment right now. And we was like, well, what'd she do? She told one of her little guy friends he was, that he was acting like a little bitch. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and I, well, was I don't like, see well, anything wrong with that. acting like a little bitch? And she was like, yeah, he was. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something with parenting, like it is so hard to like keep a straight face when your kids are doing some bullshit. Yeah, because I'm just funny. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's real as fuck. But it's like just because this is your real reaction, don't mean that we have to like, yeah, put it out there. Yeah. So you yeah, can hold it in and then call your girl and say about it. this little boy acting there. like a little bitch. Exactly. Call your auntie. And tell me that he acting like a little bitch. And I'll be like, cool. We're going to roll up on him and throw some shit at his house. Um, okay. So, yeah. Um, did you have that experience as a, as, a young, as a young tot with little boys pulling your hair? You know, like, how did you, how did you process that? I don't know that I ever... You know, if I did experience dudes being assholes, an asshole to me as a kid, matter of fact, I can think about that I probably did, and it wouldn't have even registered with me that they like me because you're not about to treat me like that. You're so a dick. Was, yeah, like it was, you know, I was the one who was always fighting boys. So if you was going to treat me <laughs> in your kind of way, then we was fighting. Her name is Killer for a reason. Yeah, so maybe they like me, but we never got that far. See, I had this little boy in school. And he liked me. And he was mean to me at first. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with him. This little boy is just mean. He picks on me and nobody else. He always, my mama would slick me down with blue magic and my little pigtails. I had a favorite style, two in the front, one in the back. And he would always pull my little pigtail. And it was the fucking worst. And then I realized he liked me because I want to say in like the third or fourth fourth it had to be like fourth grade he touched my butt one day <laughs> oh no <laughs> too soon bitch let me tell you how this little boy touched my butt we're gonna get back to the story but anyway he touched my butt and i wrote it in my diary <sighs> and i oh literally her, her fucking walked around for like years thinking somebody gonna break in my diary and see this little boy touch my butt and they gonna think I'm having sex like it was one of them like oh my god we about to the world is about to end because this little boy touched my butt but it should have been this cliff of conclusions (laughs) uh girl (laughs) talk about a spiral I was like oh my god they don't think I'm pregnant it was bad because this little boy touched my butt I mean whatever but you know I think at that point I realized I like sexual contact <laughs> and you're like oh i was I'm like sure oh to feel about this this is forbidden <laughs> do it again <laughs> <laughs> but anyway i think it's really good that we like stop our girls and our boys mm-hmm. we stop our young people in their right. tracks when they you know with the whole they're mean to you because they like you because that's mm-hmm. some absolute bullshit and I think also it teaches us how to like not be honest about our feelings and our emotions. Yes, like so that it's okay that that's standard and that's how it should be. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's difficult for young people to jump out there and say, hello, ma'am, I'm really feeling you. I get it. <laughs> and we ain't saying you got to do that, but we also ain't saying that you have to pop me in the back of my like, fucking head. Yeah. Some horrible outlet for the, for these like positive emotions and turning into something negative. Like, I think the fuck not. Because let me tell you, you mean a my baby because you like him? Exactly. I'm coming to whoop on your ass. Mm -hmm. My child, kill his child, I don't care. We whoop it on asses. I drive a big truck and I own a lot of black. (laughs) Same. Um, (laughs) Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) Sisterhood of the crazy mamas. Okay. Um, So one of the first scenes in the book is when 
Anika, she spends all this time. One of the one of her roles at Urban Grind is to do social media. Mm-hmm. So she spends all her time mapping out how their social media's page is going to be and this is how it's going to look when you go to Instagram and see all the pay all the pictures on one page that kind of thing. And then this nigga Royal comes in and posts this picture and it drove me fucking crazy. Yeah. And I say that not just a picture, a fucking selfie, selfie. of himself. Yeah. Yeah. It was some, some narcissistic bullshit. shit. And Ugh. what and then what pissed her off is that like the picture, it was a complete thirst trap. And it caught all the honeys. Mm-hmm. Well, the honey <laughs> caught all the bees. And so then she's like, damn, I can't take it down. But now I got to like deal with this like blot in my situation. Mm-hmm. But it was clear that like Anika is m- very much per- perfectionist mm-hmm. and like does not want, you know, like she has shit planned out in her head. She had a vision. She A vision. We got I mean, a girlfriend and always vision. got a vision. We do. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Um, And he fucked up her vision. And I think that it was kind of good that he, you know, so one of the things that I enjoyed, not that I, well, I guess I enjoyed. One of the, one of the good things that I got out of my marriage was that I am a perfectionist. Well, let me not say that now. I used to be a perfectionist. Like everything had to be in a particular way. Why are you Thank looking you. at me like that? Because you still... <laughs> You have gotten better. I was about to say, yes. I know you ain't talking. Yeah, no, I've Hot, gotten better kettle, too, but I'm also apple. still a perfectionist. Yes. I'm a lot less of one. I mean, you are like, a perfectionist in recovery, as am I. How about that? Can we say that I'm like on step 12 and you like on step six? Bitch, where? Why? <laughs> Because, like, I'm truly on some, like, ah, fuck it. It'll figure itself out. And you're like, no, we need to keep trying. Well, Which is good. Because- but here's the thing. You can't miss, you can't pathologize. There, there's a difference between being a perfectionist and being a professional, right? So. <laughs> so, okay, bitch. Burn. Bam. Burr. I'm burn. Whatever. Yes. Because I was going to say, like, if it was the Erica school of thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, y'all niggas would be getting a podcast every mm-hmm. when the spirit hits me. Yeah, <laughs> when the spirit hits me. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> can I tell them about Saturday? What are we doing on Saturday? Nothing. Oh, so Saturday it. morning. Oh yeah, <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> I forgot. So Saturday we set up uh, a recording. We were supposed to do an interview Saturday. I just got a new phone. Somehow my calendar got fucked up and I did not have the interview on my calendar. So I woke up, I ate an edible (laughs) and I was high as giraffe pussy. And Killa stops down and she's like, okay, I'm going to go upstairs and get us ready for the interview. And I was like, bitch, I just ate an edible. Ain't no fucking way I'm going to be able to do this damn interview. (laughs) And thankfully, my lack of perfectionism, professionalism, whatever, won out. Yeah. And we were able to reschedule because, girl. That was good because I wasn't re- I did not feel like recording anyway. Y'all, y'all would have been all <laughs> jacked up because Erica, this recovering profession, perfectionist, baby, that would have been a whole situation. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a lot more. Among, I am a lot more. Fuck it. We'll figure it out. Whereas Killa is more. No, we committed to it. Let's do it. Which, you know, it takes all types because it takes both kinds to produce this shit. Yes, that is very, very true. Not this shit. This podcast. <laughs> um, But lovely, I, I recognize that my perfectionism was like fucking up relationships. Like, and mm. not even just romantic relationships, but just relationships in general. Because I always had a, an idea of how I wanted something to play out in my mind. Like, this is going to happen this way. Mm-hmm. And I will get so fucked up if things didn't go according to plan. And it mm-hmm. would just throw off everything. My mood, the night, everything. And it was just the worst. And um, I'm happy that I am. I'm in recovery. Yeah. Because it sh- I'm now able to kind of. Let shit ride. Let shit slide. And also, like, just appreciate. Like, so old Erica would have definitely, well, old Erica probably wouldn't have popped an edible (laughs) at fucking eight in the morning. Whatever time in the morning, yeah. But um, 
you know, I definitely would have been like really fucked up, but it worked out. We were able to reschedule and I laid around staring at the ceiling for the rest of the fucking day. Yeah. So how does you, how does your perfectionism affect your relationships? Um, well, so what it used to affect the way that it used to affect me was more big picture. So not necessarily, um, you know, this is how I wanted this day to go or that kind of thing, but more like, this is the plan that I have for my life. And this is the way that these things are supposed to go. So I am supposed to graduate undergrad this time, start grad school, finish, get into a relationship, be together for this number of years then get married, then be together for this amount of time, then get pregnant, then buy, you know, all of this stuff. Like I had this whole fucking life plan. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I did actually work the plan. But the problem was that my shit imploded. And it was really a reckoning for me to understand that you can plan whatever the fuck you want, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't guarantee you happiness. It doesn't bring you joy (laughs) or it doesn't necessarily... um, and that you can you can put everything to down to the, the tiniest little bit in terms of what your plan is going to be, but it doesn't guarantee you anything. And that was a really difficult thing for me to learn because, like, getting divorced and all of that, it was a wonderful decision. It was exactly what I should have done when I did it. I should have done it before that. Um, but it wasn't – like, that. that wasn't – tough like that part wasn't difficult separating from my ex-husband wasn't the hard part emotionally whatever it was the fact that I had had this plan and my plan had failed and that I needed to come up with a new plan and even do you think that you look back and you're like okay now I need to recognize that like having an outline is good but and I think this is why I'm so against a list remember yeah Mm -hmm. so um, because I don't want to be so set on the list that I miss out on the rest, of, you know, like on yeah. everything else, you know, like I don't want to be so caught up in, does this hit the list that there's something that's not on the list that I should have been looking for. That was a red flag, you know, and I, and yeah, it's like going to the grocery store and realizing that you need some ketchup and it's not on your list and being like, I can't get it. It's not on my list. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, um, that's definitely yeah. how I was in terms of perfectionism. And also, like, you can't think of everything. Like, I am the right. type of person where I le- I have plans A through Z. Like, I definitely have plans A through Z. But then plan 12K star asterisk <laughs> exclamation point shows up. Well, you know, problem star mm-hmm. exclamation point shows up. And I am like, what the fuck, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I've learned to kind of ease up on this perfectionism and just kind of make a plan to just wing it some, not wing it, but you know, like we'll feel this out. We'll figure Mm -hmm. it out as we go along. Yeah. I I think what happened with me is I kind of swung the other way. So I went from, oh, I've got this plan to, oh, I don't have a plan at all. And I refuse to plan because... It felt too stifling. So for like two years after my divorce, I just felt very unmoored. Um, I look, I refer to it as like a time of transition. And I didn't, in some ways I realized it in the moment, but really I got it like once I had decided that, oh, okay, I'm ready to start figuring out what's next. Like I wasn't writing, like I didn't write any books during that time because I just didn't. You didn't? Mm -mm. I didn't write any books during that time. Mm. And I had just, I had put out two before that and I just stopped because I didn't feel like I could devote that amount of energy or that amount of time because like, you know, once you start writing a book, you're on like a two year trajectory. And I just didn't feel like I could dedicate myself to anything like that in that time because I wasn't in a space where I could plan anymore because my shit had fallen apart. I realized in hindsight that like I had moved a couple of times. I didn't put my art up anywhere. I didn't turn any of the houses where I was living into a home. Yeah. Like all of that was a manifestation of me not feeling like I could create any plans. And a lot of it mostly was probably just that I didn't trust myself. But so, I don't think that there's anything wrong in having that period. No, you know? I think it was useful. Yeah. Like because I think, therapy also loomed really large in that time. And yep. it helped me to get to a place where I could trust myself and did feel like I could start, if not, you know, creating a life plan, like plotting some some points I wanted to hit along the way. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. I think that 
yeah, as I think about like coming out of divorce and coming out of just shit, Mm -hmm. um, I definitely had a period where I was just kind of just existing, you know, just kind of wherever, whatever, you know, and I think most women coming out of divorce go through that where they on a bow head ho shit, bow head ho (laughs) shit, you know, and I, FYI, as soon as the outside opens back up, I will be on my bow head ho shit. But anyway, um, but I think it's, you know, I think it's valuable having that period where you're not. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, like, bam, bam, Any bam, milestones. what's next? Because yeah. you you have to just, it allows you to just feel and figure things out, you know? Because um, when I was going through that period, I I learned a little bit more about myself and what I like to do, what I'll deal with, what I want. So mm-hmm. um, I definitely think that it was, yeah, it was definitely the, the complete swing of the pendulum. I mean, I was, because I'm the type of person... I have routines. This is what I do on this day. This is what I do on that day. That kind of stuff. And I just they ain't do none of that. It was like I'd wake up on a Saturday and be like, "Who house I'm gonna go sit at?" and not do anything, you know. So, um, but I think it was valuable. Looking back, it taught me a lot. Okay. Um. So this story is based during. One of my favorite times of the year, Christmas. <laughs> and for me, I'm not even like really big into like Christmas Day. It's just like the season leading up to it is just so special to me. <laughs> hmm. Um, I love getting the tree. I love decorating. I love blasting all my Christmas black music and making my son untangle lights with me like it's just oh <laughs> and so um alexis is that her name anika my bad <laughs> and she takes another sip of her drink so i wish i could drink though they look really good they are um anika really resonated with me in that sense where she was like really into christmas But at the same time, like, there was a lot of change happening in her family. So she wasn't going to be able to do Christmas the way that she normally did. Mm -hmm. And I really struggled with that for a while, especially Mm -hmm. with a child. Mm -hmm. Because with my family, Christmas is a big, well, with my family, particularly with my mom who passed away five years ago, Christmas was a big deal. Yeah, it's been five years. Yeah. Um, Christmas was a big deal. Like we would do all of the things and then we go to Granny's house on Christmas morning to open gifts and have brunch, which was like breakfast Thanksgiving. Um, it was just a really big deal. And so living here in the DC area, so far away from everyone, forced me to like reevaluate how does Christmas look. I call this Christmas, but it re- it caused me to reevaluate how Christmas looks. And I'm still kind of trying to figure that out, me and my son. Mm-hmm. And we do something di- a little different every year and some things stick, some things don't. But I thought it was really nice how um, Christina wrote, you know, made that a part of the story because a- Anika Her family was really big into Christmas. She was really big into Christmas. But this year, her mom and daddy was like, we're going to go on a cruise. And her mama was pretty much, in so many words, like, I'm going to be dicked down on Christmas Day. And you figure that shit out. Well, she didn't say we were supposed to go on a cruise for Christmas last year. Bitch. We were like, we we had in our head, like, we're going to take the kids on a Disney cruise for Christmas. Yeah. And our asses would have still been stuck out at somebody's somebody's fucking harbor. And yeah, in Florida. Yeah. Oh, honey, Thank God we didn't go. Look at <laughs> look at God. Look at God. <laughs> look at God. Um. So, but with my family, holidays are a big thing anyway. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because we recently had the uh Fourth of July. I don't even call it Independence Day. It's Fourth of July. Independence. Yeah, it's it's literally Fourth of July, the Negro holiday of uh, barbecue and, and fireworks. Yeah. 
And Killa just laughed because she was just like, I love that you enjoy this holiday <laughs> as much as you do. And part of it is just because it's a family thing. And so even here, like we went and bought a whole bunch of firecrackers. I woke up on the 4th of July overhearing my brother telling my son, <laughs> well, you know, it ain't the 4th of July if you ain't worried about losing an appendage. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh. oh. Yeah. So we were doing that out here too. But anyway, so we I'm also like, indoctrinated my child into uh, <laughs> fireworks because we had never done them. You know, that ain't my shit. Yeah. And she literally came over and was like, you got some more fireworks. <laughs> it made me pop the last of the ones we had. She was really sad when she came home on the fifth. She was like, did they do fireworks without me? I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, they did. But you also have been doing them with your auntie for more than a week. Mm-hmm. It's okay. I was like, that's why y'all did them ahead of time. It's okay. Yeah, but it, I, yeah, it's it's one of the things that we do. And now that I'm older, I look back and I think about like how I felt as a kid. And so mm-hmm. I always want to replicate that with my son. Um. So yeah, we do it. And like, I hope he looks back fondly and be like, me and my uncle wake up super early and go outside and pop fireworks while he was drinking beer and grilling, you know? And I yeah. hope that your child thinks about, it, you know, thinks about it the same way. Like my mom would drop me off at my auntie Munch house and we would just pop fireworks and I watch her get drunk yeah. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah, I thought it was really great how they like how she brought in the Christmas aspect of it all. Mm-hmm. I noticed with you, Killa, you're not quite that way. Like, even the holidays that are your holidays are, like, your holidays because you're like, we ain't going nowhere. We're going to watch movies. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I am a lone wolf. I don't know. I like to, I don't know. I like to be quiet. I like to use holidays as a time to just be peaceful and not be running around. Probably because when I was a kid, we would spend them running from house to house. You know, like grandma house, auntie house, other auntie house, uncle house. Like we would have to like do the rounds and see everybody because all my family was still in Cleveland. Um, And now as an adult, I like want to do the exact opposite. I just like to stay in my house. (laughs) I don't want to be bothered. And I mean, that's not always true. Like we did um, Christmas Eve at one of our friend's house, right? Like I like stuff like that, small groups where we can just go and be somewhere and the kids can play and the adults can play and we can pass around fat babies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like that's fun to me in small groups that don't involve a bunch of strangers because you know how I feel about strangers. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Because even that friend like to invite strangers, but at this point we know all those people, so they're not strangers no more. Um, but yeah, no, I like to chill. Like you on the fourth, you saw me for two seconds when I was leaving to try to go get some food. Yeah, I, you know. Well, it works out because your child is a lot like me in my mm-hmm. family in the sense where she's like, it's a holiday. I'm gonna put on an outfit and we're gonna turn up, and so she can just skedaddle her little tail on over here. Yeah, and do that. And usually, like like to bring it back to Christmas and and part of I think why I why I've become a little bit more entrenched in this with with regards to Christmas is that um typically my daughter goes with her dad on Christmas so Mm -hmm. like Thanksgiving is my holiday we may have an agreement to say she's supposed to switch but fuck that it's mine Mm -hmm. so she's with me all day Thanksgiving everyone understands and respects that we watch musicals we bake pies you know we eat our not traditional (laughs) Thanksgiving (laughs) meal yes or our fried fish or something um and then for Christmas you know we do one gift on Christmas Eve we do gifts in the morning we have we do have our tradition where we get we all go to breakfast together Um, And then she goes to her dad's. And so it's always just kind of been a respite for me. Mm -hmm. Like, I like to spend a day kind of laying around and not doing a whole lot and watching movies. And, you know, that's, yeah. Yeah, see, I I feel like kids, kids, because, and this is because this is how I grew up. But I feel Mm -hmm. like Christmas, you're supposed to see all your cousins Mm -hmm. And show them, show them your toys. You should, you see their toys, that kind of thing. Yeah, but yeah. because my kid's an only child and all of our family is in another place, like I usually spend Christmas morning 
playing Beyblades or learning how to do some Roblox (laughs) activity or something like that. But I mean, and then that spills over into brunch and then, you know, my kid goes on her own, but it's, but that's why she goes right. Because my ex-husband's family is here. And so I want her to have that experience. Yeah. Uh Yeah, I want her to be with her cousins in somebody's basement all day and you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, my child will be somewhere smoking hookah and (laughs) tipping some bartender. (laughs) If it was, if he was spending it with, yeah, his daddy. His, mm-hmm. So yeah, there's that. Yep. <laughs> okay, so, know your audience. So now that because we're at the turn on, mm-hmm. let's talk about the sex. Mm-hmm. I'll be very honest. I couldn't read too much of this sex scene <laughs> because, baby. This pussy of mine is like this. Aww. <laughs> it is dry and dusty and there are cobwebs in this motherfucker. This quarantine has been so horrible with my uh, with my coupap. Like my coupappy has just been <sighs> Yeah. Anyway, this was a oh. great sex scene. It's just I couldn't I couldn't read too much of it because Honey, I was I'd read it and get started and then I'd pull out Jerome and then I'd fall asleep. Oh well. And I'd be like, oh shit. I mean I, I guess that means that phone. Christina did her job. Yeah, she did she did her job <laughs> very well. But I thought it was really cute. The scene that you read mm. the when they first had sex, I thought it was really cute that it was like, oh, um, uh, you left your bobby pin right here, and I need to make sure you get it because you're gonna need a night. bobby pin tomorrow morning. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let me in. <laughs> Have you played those games? No, it just makes me think of love. Oh, again, you still haven't fucking watched Love Jones. And I won't now. Come on, B. I just wanna come up and talk. I mean, it's a classic line, and you don't know it. <laughs> I mean, I've experienced it, not down no gym. Okay, yeah, no. Nah. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, I mean, not definitely not coming from me because I'm very direct about sex. Um, hey, 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 <laughs> come put that dick over here. Swing Listen, that dick this way. My partner the other day. <laughs> I like went and like gathered materials and threw them on the bed. He was like, "Really, bitch? Is this, is this your game, <laughs> <laughs> nigga? You just think I get hit in the head with a bottle of lube and that's I it? I literally threw a lube and a toy and a towel on the bed. <laughs> he was mm-hmm. like, he's like, oh, this is your game.' And I was like, I mean, listen, I asked you how you wanted me to approach if if I needed to like warm you up or if I could just say it or whatever and you said you didn't care so this is what it is today let's get it <laughs> you didn't need a warm had. up I'm telling you so yeah. I, I don't you know. have time to I don't have time to pussy foot round this pussy exactly you know I'd be tired so you know let's get it before I fall asleep <laughs> oh. it's really the thing yeah yeah okay well I have done you? that bullshit and I have I don't even want to say I've fallen for the bullshit, but I recognize the bullshit and be like, all right, come on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I left my do-rag at your house. All sure. right. Come on. Come get it. Yeah, I definitely. <laughs> oh, I miss having to, having to sleep I? with my do-rag. Uh, that that might have been a thing at some point when I was living in New York once I was lo- not in long-distance relationships, maybe. I don't fucking know. The 20s are a blur. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bitch, yes. Yeah. So, um, but I just thought that was like, and this is why I love this story because Christina uses like really, you can tell she's like writing for us. Like she has really great dialogue. She has really good just situations and scenarios that this rings very true. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, I didn't see, I didn't done that. I didn't experience it. I didn't seen folks do it. Like, oh. You left this box top, and I know you care about your kid getting him his school, getting him 73 cents. So, okay, I'm drunk on my way home from the club, but I'll get an Uber over there to make sure you get your box top. <laughs> 15 minutes later. Right. <laughs> um, also, Royal. First, oh, can we just go back a few things? Uh, 
go back a pulse, a beat. Mm -hmm. Let's go back a beat. Okay, first, I this nail is driving me crazy. I oh. like slammed a door and my nail fell off, mm -hmm. but now I'm embracing these press on nails. So I have like bright fluorescent orange nails. I really like them. Nine of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. But I talk with my hands, and so I keep seeing this nub, like, <laughs> it's like, sexy, sexy, sexy nub. <laughs> okay. It's probably somebody that love that nub. Shut up. Mm -hmm. Well, you can come. Anyway, let me quit. <laughs> Honey, I'm so hard up for some sex. Okay. Um, Royal was fine. Like, she wrote mm -hmm. this. I could just see him being fine. You, well, yeah, I see him in my head, too. But I'm so annoyed by him. <laughs> that I can't he even was, lean he into was the such a, I mean, I think he realized that he like hit a chord, struck a nerve with her. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, oh, I struck a nerve and that's where it is. I'm going to pluck that motherfucker every time I see you. So, yeah, he exactly. was a jerk. But then like, a, see, this is me, you know, falling for the brainwash of the pra patriarchy. <laughs> I'm like, he was annoying and like a sweet come put your tongue in my pussy kind of way yeah no he aggravated me but i got it and and you know eventually he is able to say how he feels and blah 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 and not just be the little boy pulling her pigtail so i guess yeah the problem yeah. is i would have never got there <laughs> you'd be like okay i'm done <laughs> um so this fine nigga had her coming not once, not twice, but three times a lady. Mm -hmm. Was it three times? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and she yeah. was like, that was impossible because she couldn't even really get, she could barely get two on her own. So the idea of hitting three with this raggedy nigga. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have multiple orgasms or are you a one and done kind of gal? Oh, no. Is this too personal a, to ask? No, I'm, I'm a, I can't stop. <laughs> I just keep coming. Yeah, <laughs> like I like yeah. have like baby ones, and then I have like a monster one, and my hair will grow like three inches, and then I'll be like. <laughs> and the thing is, monster, and then I have babies, and then the babies have babies, and I. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, <laughs> shit! You a grandma by the time it's all done. <laughs> yeah, I have like, cause the thing is, like my monster one usually finishes it off. Because by the time mm. it's the monster one, I'm like sweaty and spent and like, you saw yeah. it was coming. If you ain't feel like it was your time, to, <laughs> it's like double dutch. Nigga, you had an opening. If you jump ain't in. feel like you needed to jump in, then sorry for you. Sorry. I mean, you, you should have saw it coming, right? Mm. That's funny. So I um did this class and it was called the... 15 myths of men and sex or 15 hmm. myths men believe about sex. This is part of your um, sex educator. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it was very uh, binary. I will begin with mm -hmm. that. But okay. it, but one of the things that they noted was that, so there was this guy, he wrote this book and it asked guys like all these questions about sex. And it's like this in-depth, see, I need to work on explaining shit to people because this is my explanation. So it was like this in-depth study <laughs> about men and sex. And it asked me tons of questions. But the guy that taught the class, he was like, I'm really interested in these questions about like men and sexuality and attraction around other men. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he kind of talked about like how like in sports, like this is supposed to be so like hetero, blah, 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 blah. But they always pat each other on the butt, you know, yeah. or they get naked in a locker room, that kind of thing. Or, right. you know, like circle shit jerks and shit like, like that. Some people like to call homoerotic, which is just another natural expression of, of sexuality. Yeah. So one of the things that, so they interviewed a bunch of men. And one of the things that men said, and I might have said this on the podcast before, men are so worried about making sure that women come mm -hmm. that them when when a man sees a woman have an orgasm then they can like let go and be like oh okay my job is done now i can yeah enjoy myself so knowing that now i'm even more like look bro i didn't came about three two three times before my big mama come comes 
Big Mama Cone yeah. Combs. <laughs> um, Take advantage. So you saw it come once and I kept mm-hmm. going. That's the, the double dash going. Ch- 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 ch. You saw it come again. Ch- ch- ch. Nigga, if you don't jump in and get yours before mine come, <laughs> I'm about to pack these telephone wires away and uh go home. Did y'all used to play double dutch with telephone wires? We sure did. Mm-hmm. In the street with no shoes on. Because they're the perfect. They'd be black. They're the, the perfect, the like, <laughs> oh my. Uh, Except for you didn't want to get hit because them shits hurt. Them shits hurt. Yeah. Also. And I was never good at double dutching. So. I was about to say the same thing. I was never yeah. good at double dutching. <gasps> we should do that one day. What? Double dutch? Bitch, just I go outside. Gonna, and I can barely it. do it when I was a kid. I can jump. Yeah, we should but just I go outside ain't. and jump rope. Okay. And we're like 80s babies. So remember they used to show them videos of like the black girls in Harlem doing a double mm-hmm. dutch competition. And the high socks and little shit. And I'll be like, damn. I know, I feel bad. <laughs> we ain't got this culture in St. Louis. Uh, we, I mean, we we used to jump in the street in front of my granddaddy house. Like I said, no shoes. You would wrap the core around behind your back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I could turn because I yeah, been, I could turn because my ignorant ass didn't want to be left out. I just couldn't yeah, yeah. jump. I'm like, no, girl, you jump. Just keep giving me the tea. Now, what did mm-hmm. they say about that boy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So back to orgasms. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like, look, you'd have had your chance to jump in if you ain't trying to jump in. When this last one come, I'm so done. Wait, once you, so once you come, you're out. You don't keep going. I mean, I have. I come a lot. But okay, like but once, once I get your... the my big one, yeah, nigga, I ain't no good. I'm gonna lay there <laughs> and I'm gonna let you if you feel like you need to. But you gotta be comfortable with fucking a fish because I'm gonna be there like <laughs> boneless, <laughs> boneless, <laughs> nigga. Call me Chili's because I am a boneless chicken nugget. I wing, don't understand whatever. <laughs> Chili's has the boneless wings. Oh, okay, but anyway, or. Call me BW3s or whatever. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, like I take my ball and go home. I remember I was having a threesome and like, nigga, I came so hard. <laughs> and I was like, all right, y'all have fun. I'm going to go fix something for me to eat. <laughs> it was like, damn, you took your ball and went home. Yeah, Nigga, read the room. <laughs> you should have been like, oh, things about to happen. Let me get mine. If you didn't. <laughs> Well, not my problem. I'm such a selfish lover. Oh, yeah. I, I sp- maybe it helps because of the order of mine. So we had the big one, and then the it's like after. Sh- well, they're not aftershocks. They're their own full on orgasms. I don't know. Yeah, I, like once that's come, I just kind of keep going. But I usually need a little bit of a. Let me just just let me breathe for a second. <laughs> And then I can keep it. I can keep it going. Okay, you don't fuck fat guys. I do. I do, bitch. Not. I've had Sit girl. I'd be like, nigga, you got to get up off of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I try to like understand because like I'm not really into like holding my own body weight up either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I mean, I, nigga, I get it. <laughs> but <laughs> we get to a point. I need to stop drinking. <laughs> we get to a point i'm like look bro you gotta figure this shit out because uh oh my god you too heavy for all of this <laughs> <laughs> okay how do we end up here i don't how know okay. oh lord me. okay well remember. speaking of fucking fat guys and uh you know leaving it laying your body weight on a nigga Okay. Let's turn to our segment called What's Turning Us On? I was like, where the fuck are you going with this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for this segment, we always like to talk about something that's turning us on this week. Something that we like to use mm-hmm. around sex, eroticism, romanticism. So, Killa, you take it. Sure. So, What's turning on us on this week is the Liberator Wedge. Um, I remember seeing it for a long time. Like, it would come up when I would do various searches for various things. It's always advertised on the sites. Um, but it never felt like, okay, it's a wedge. I got pillows. Um, <laughs> but um, 
I don't know. One day I was just kind of like looking for some things to kind of, oh, you know, like maybe we could do some different positions or we could, you know, this kind of thing. And I felt like, oh, maybe a wedge is good for changing it up. Because sometimes just the slightest little variation of an angle can mean mm-hmm. a difference between you coming in two minutes and you coming in 20 minutes. Because also, I don't like fucking on my pillows. Yeah. Because. Especially if you're sweating, like that pillowcase is not enough of a barrier. You literally got like just a pussy yeah. sweat soaked pillow. Continue. Exactly. Um, so one of the things that I like about this wedge is that it has a removable um, fabric like case or like a, like a pillowcase. And it's easy to get on. It's easy to get off. So you literally use it. It gets wet up. That's okay. You take it off. You toss it in the washing machine and you put it back on and it's good as new. And because it's so thick, the actual pillow itself doesn't get wet. So there's no funkiness. Like (laughs) no juices. (laughs) Yeah, no lingering juiciness. Um, It's just really good for, I think, making slight adjustments. We don't use it very frequently, um, but if you're in a, in a space where, like, I've taken it to hotels before, where it adjusted the bed height to where it to be. <laughs> Y'all travel with this pillow? We travel with a lot of stuff. I mean, I travel. <laughs> I definitely have my dick kit. Like, when I'm, especially when I'm on some bald head hoe shit, bald head yeah. hoe shit, and I'm traveling, I got my shit. But it's a small, this is compact. A car, this is a car trip. Discreet bag. Still, I cannot imagine pulling up. It has its own little case. To the Howard Johnsons, <laughs> to the Hojos. With okay, my- I'm not, we ain't in no Hojo. But this is where we went to that resort. Anyway, um, it has its own oh, little Oh, yeah. That, I'm like, resort? Yeah, that resort. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, yeah uh-huh. <laughs> so you, I don't think you would really necessarily know what it was. And it like crunches down. It's it's as discreet as it can be. You okay. know what I'm saying? Whatever. I also Who don't fucking care. cares? Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's good for like making small shifts and for, um, vis- visibility. Yo, yes, I could see you drawing a picture in your mind. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you ever, if you are someone who have, has ever wanted to get into a, a different position and had trouble holding yourself up, it can be really good for folks who have disabilities that make it hard to hold their body weight up. What? It would also be good for filming. Yeah, that's why I said visibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'd be really good for, for increasing visibility for various things. Um, and also, even if you don't have trouble, like if you lean over it, it could be really good for holding you up for any type of a rear entry position, that kind of thing. Um, and then they have like various sizes and you can kind of put them together like building blocks to hold up various parts of your body. Like I, I think it's a really good disability tool, but it's also a good positioning for anybody who wants it or needs it. I really enjoy it. And mm. I like that it's easy to clean. Yeah. Yeah. That's always clean. Yeah. Always key. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So y'all can find information about that on our website in the show notes for this episode. You can click the link and purchase your own. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with that said, um, I think that wraps up this episode of The Turn On. This is Erica and Kenria. Two hoes making it clap. (laughs) We did it at the same time the first time, but it wasn't loud. Bye, y'all. Bye. This episode was produced by us, Kenry and Erica, and edited by Ballistic. The theme music is from Brazy. Now you can support the turn on and get off. Subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, then drop us a five-star review, and you'll be entered to win one of the things that's turning us on. To enter, just post your review and email a screenshot of it to the turn on podcast at gmail.com. Our Patreon page is also live. Become a supporter today and you'll access lots of goodies, including the Turn On Book Club and two-for-one raffle entries. Don't forget to send us your book recommendations and sex and related questions and follow us on Twitter at The Turn On Pod and Instagram at The Turn On Podcast. You can find links to books, merch, transcripts, guest info, and other fun stuff at theturnonpodcast.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you soon. Bye.